Hi, Common Ground. My name is Rigby Wallace, and I am so excited to share this moment with you. It's Thursday. It's the day before Passover. And Mark is inviting us into this final moment of Holy Week. He's inviting us to be witnesses to this final season and moment in, in Jesus' suffering. It's uncomfortable, it's brutal, and even scandalous. So let's together as families, friends, singles, wherever you're gathered watching this, let's open our hearts to some of the things God might want to whisper to us and show us and teach us. In verse 41 of Mark chapter 14, you would have heard yesterday that the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And when Mark records that, the words of Jesus as the hour has come, it's almost like introducing us to the grand finale, to the climax. The pace is picking up. And as things draw to a dramatic and even urgent close, listen in the background. What do we hear? Across the city of Jerusalem, we hear the bleeding of lambs as Jewish households prepare for Passover. The next day is going to be the darkest day for Jesus and his disciples. So let's read on in Mark chapter 14 from verse 43 together. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under God. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, yet even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these, mess, these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment and said, what further witnesses do we need? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it saying, 
I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a while, while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began, to, he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and he wept. As we reflect together on this passage, we'll try and answer just two questions. The first is what do, or who do I most identify with in this passage? Who am I most like as I hold this passage up as a, a mirror to my life? And the second question, what are the ironies in play? So the first question, who do you or who do I most identify with in this passage and to whom am I most like? So first up is Judas the betrayer. He's the guy who goes to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. And they were all uh, uh, glad to be able to, to uh, give him money for this betrayal. In verse 44 in our text says, And when the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under God. And when he came, he went up to him and once, at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Mark ends the story of Judas's life simply with this kiss. And the Greek word for this kiss carries with it a certain intensity. It was still affectionate. It was fervent. And yet it was deeply hypocritical. It was fake love that he gave to Jesus. And Judas is no victim in all of this. Some have tried to defend him, saying he betrayed uh, Jesus to force him to set, to set up his kingdom prematurely on earth. But Warren Weasby says, Judas was neither a martyr nor a robot. He was a responsible human being who made his own decisions but in so doing, fulfill the word of God. He must not be made out to be a hero. After all, someone had to betray Jesus or a helpless victim of merciless predestination. Friends, Judas was lost for the same reason millions have lost today. He had not repented of his sins, even his secret sins of greed. He refused to fully trust Jesus. He had done the cost-benefit analysis of, of being in the inner circle and carrying the money bags and helping himself to it, some of the other gospel writers inform us. And so like Jesus, many of us today have spent time in the inner circles, maybe in a Christian family, maybe with believing friends, maybe in a social circle of Christians, even actively involved in charity and so-called Christian work programs. And yet we don't know Jesus personally as our saving Lord. Let's consider that as we bear witness to this last and final couple of days in the life of Jesus. The next group of people we can ask, are we like them? in any way is the crowd that come. This crowd includes a delegation of temple gods. Once tolerant and mildly intrigued, they've now become fickle, even aggressive, even antagonistic. Had the new narrative in town begun to turn them from fans into fiends? Is it possible that when Groups of people are swept up with emotion that we can be caught up in that. It says they came to him uh, uh, as a crowd with swords and clubs. It seems like the dominant emotion in play here 
is anger, contempt, with malice. And friends, this speaks to us in our day. Groupthink, popular opinion, can stir us up in ways that are not helpful. We can surrender to sort of a cultural accommodation of Jesus as a nice guy, a good moral teacher, or even be like this crowd we're becoming outraged by his claims and the evidence of his perfect life being the Messiah that was to come. And then there's this religious system of the day populated with priests and high priests, and they want to eliminate Jesus. The dominant emotion here is envy. They see Jesus as competition. They're losing market share. But Jesus is protected by his popular popularity in general in the city. And so they go secretly. They plan secretly. They do it by night because they wanted to avoid the confrontation. They want to speed up his arrest and his death before Passover was fully celebrated. And it says in verse 49, day after day, Jesus says, I was with you in the temple teaching and uh, uh, teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Jesus stares down the religious system of the day. He doesn't back off. He's on a mission from God to do what he's called to do. He's fulfilling Isaiah 53, come what may, 24 hours later. He's fulfilling Psalm 22. The question we've got to ask ourselves as we look at this callous, cold religious system of the day, are we in any way like that? Is my heart frozen? Is there creeping indifference? Can we read this text and find our hearts warmed and thawed, softened and prepared for the gift that's coming our way on Friday? Or perhaps Peter, if G- Judas is on the front foot in collusion and betrayal, Peter is on the back foot in withdrawal and temporary de- denial, as we read. And can you imagine this self-assured guy is suddenly so confused? Jesus was the Messiah. He announced it. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. But he couldn't cope with the suffering Savior. His impulsiveness, he, he cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. This is impetuous Peter at his best. And uh, Jesus has to heal that high priest's ear. And there's this pendulum swing in Peter from this front-footed, bold, I'm with you to the end. You know, if anybody denies you, I won't. And now he drifts away from full devotion into a kind of self-preservation. Are we like that a little in tough times? Are we like that when we can't make sense of it all? We drift. It's a time to see how wonderfully Jesus is at work. You see, Judas had self-pity. Simon Peter wept in repentance. He remembered the words of Jesus. He was under the word of Jesus that said, when you hear that that rooster crow on the second time, you would have denied me three times. But you see, there's something else he might have remembered. One of the other gospel writers, Jesus speaks to Peter and says, when you are converted after this episode, Why don't you strengthen your brothers? Jesus is anticipating the great restoration of this man who blew it in a moment, yet becomes this fantastic leader in the future. We're also most like Simon Peter when, like him, we deny Jesus when we back off. And I notice in this passage that he's asked explicitly, are you one of them? That thing of uh, not wanting to carry the reputation of what it means to be a Christ follower with conviction and with boldness. And there are times when maybe we lack courage and we're not fully devoted followers of Jesus. Could we maybe identify in this passage with Mark himself, the author? 
In verse 51, we read the word, and a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. They seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Most commentators say that was Mark. And this is none other than Mark reading himself into the story. Maybe we can learn from him. Let's get in the story. We're, we're in this. This whole story is written for us, not just by Mark. And he's also making himself an eyewitness to the historical truthfulness of this record. And Mark is showing by putting himself in there that he's taken a side. Neutrality is not an option. And friends, everybody back then and now in relation to Jesus needs to take a side. And then finally, what are the ironies in play in this passage? That's the second big question. The scandal of Holy Week is captured best by this term irony. It's a literal technique that requires cleverness on the part of the writer and quite a bit of effort on behalf of the reader. It's like Mark is winking at the reader and expects the reader to pick it up. When a reader, when writer employs irony, what is said cannot be understood without rejecting what it seems to say at first glance. And the arrest and the trial of Jesus and this episode in this passage is just baptized in irony. Consider these marks of irony. Firstly, the Prince of Peace is approached by a mob carrying swords and clubs. God's sin offering is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. The one who is sovereignly in control of all things is being arrested. The light of the world is taken at night and in darkness. The God of pure love is betrayed by a deceitful kiss. The omnipotent one is bound. The embodiment of truth has false witness speak lies about him. And he is considered a blasphemer. The only completely innocent one is pronounced guilty. The judge of all men is judged by men. The great high priest of heaven is judged guilty by an earthly high priest. And finally, the advocate of all, man, of all men remains personally silent when accused. To defend himself means he will not be able to defend us. Tomorrow is Good Friday. And God is about to turn the angry blows of men into the kiss of reconciling love. John the Baptist describes this, this moment in the story when he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world, this dark world. And friends, how we need him. Good Friday is coming. Won't you join me as we come before our God and Savior in prayer? Lord, our hearts are tenderized as we as we expose our hearts to the Word of God and as we hold this passage up as a mirror to our lives, as we are renewed in our perspectives. I ask you, Lord, to do a deeper work in us. I want to ask you, Lord, to be at work in our hearts that might have grown cold in the season we're in, where you might have drifted, where we were at the margins like Peter around a campfire confused and wondering how it all ends. Why don't you draw us to yourself? You help us to sense your hand, your grip of grace on our lives in a fresh way. Thank you for your amazing love. Thank you that you have us in your sights. Thank you for Good Friday. Thank you for the amazing work of reconciliation through your son, Jesus Christ, that we will celebrate tomorrow. Be glorified, we pray. Amen.